Hi everyone, it's John. Long time no see. Um, I've been away, busy with other things, as per usual. But it has been a while, several months, I think, since I've showed you any new books that I've bought. And I wanted to do that today. In fact, I promised Peg at the History Shelf that I would do this on Monday. Apologies. Um, sometimes time just gets away from me. But before I show you any books, I wanted to riff on something that at least uh, two or three other booktubers that I watch occasionally do. If you are in the Northern Hemisphere, it is well into fall. And fall, of course, at least for me, means even more tea drinking than usual. And a lot of people, especially Catherine from Taking Tea with Catherine, and lately Hannah from Hannah's Books, have been showing what they drink at the beginning of each and every video. I figured that maybe, at least today, and maybe for the rest of the year, while it's cold enough to actually drink hot tea, uh, I'll show you what I'm drinking. This is, I was actually thinking about showing you the box that it came in, and then I thought, I wonder if that might be a copyright issue thing. But uh, this is from Celestial Seasonings. I'll just show you that. Uh, whoever drinks tea in this tiny little sort of thimble sized cup, I don't know how you do that. Okay, this is my tea cup. It's a mason jar. Um, this is also not hot tea. It's still in the 70s here, so uh, in Texas, you know, it has to be iced until it falls into the 50s or 60s. Um, this is a flavor from Celestial Seasonings called Caramel Apple Dream. And I'm not going to show you the box for uh, already mentioned reasons, but I really urge you to look the box up online because the front cover art is probably the cutest thing you've ever seen. It's a bunch of squirrels or possibly chip chipmunks riding apples down a river of caramel. It's... So cute. <clears throat> anyway, when you drink this hot and you add however much sugar or sugar substitute you want to it, if that's your thing, this tastes exactly like mold apple cider. And uh, for someone who can't do exactly uh, that, because it, it tends to have a lot of added sugar, this is ideal for me. <laughs> And it's, it's absolutely delicious. I thought it would be really tough to pull off caramel and apple flavors in a tea without sort of coming off synthetic and gross. But they managed to do it, and they managed to do it pretty well. It's, um, it's really tasty stuff. So, cheers, and on with the book haul. So... I think I have 10 books today to show you. Um, all of them I've gotten over the past three or four months. There will be a second part to this, by the way, which I'll post in a week or two. Uh, I've been eyeing this book for a while. This is Robert M. Sapolsky's Behave, The Biology of Humans at Our Best and Worst. Sapolsky came out with, I think he's written a couple of memoirs, one of which I bought at a used bookstore last year and read and posted a review of on my channel. If you're interested in that, you can just search Sapolsky in my videos and that should pop up. I didn't know it would be a memoir, though. I thought it would be something, you know, actually more about the actual psychology. Uh, but, but this, I know, is... So um, I've been waiting for this to come down to a relatively um, decent price, and once it did, I snatched it up from Hamilton Books, which Peg introduced me to, so thank you, Peg. Um, next, let's see, how many of these are from Hamilton Books? Pro probably more than half. <laughs> I won't tell you each and every one, but this one definitely was too. This is uh, David Canadine's uh, Victoria's Century, 
the United Kingdom from 1800 to 1906. And, you know, per, per the author, if you're familiar with him, he's, he is one of the, you know, half a dozen or so popular historians that is just, you know, great when it comes to England. So, uh, or the, the United Kingdom more generally. So, um, this and, uh, uh, last year or the year before I bought The Decline and Fall of the British Aristocracy, which is going to be quite a, a chore. It's, I think it's eight hundred, eight or 900 pages long, but this is more manageable at a, a mere 500 or so. Uh, also on Hamilton Books for just a song, I think something like two or three dollars. <clears throat> My first ever book by Robert Alter. <laughs> um, always looking for uh, stuff by him. I really, really want the three volume um, translation of the Old Testament. Really, really want it, but I want a, a nice copy and. I don't want to pay $150, so I'm waiting. I'm, I'm stalking several sites to, see, to, to find something I like. This is The Art of Biblical Narrative by Robert Alter, in which he basically uh, looks at the Bible as a literary document, a series of literary documents, actually, and sort of looks at how the prose functions, how light motifs work, how, why poetry is written in particular ways and how this part of the history is supposed to work. I mean, it's basically not looking at any of the theological claims that the Bible makes, but looking at how it functions as an actual document. There's another really fascinating book I reviewed around the time of when I first started this channel, and it was by Northrop Fry called The Bible Code, The Bible as Literature. I reviewed that. I'm thinking this is going to be somewhat along the same lines, but less literary theory and more just analysis of how the text works. But uh, I'll have to dive in to actually verify that. Next are uh, two books actually, on a subject that I've wanted to really um, get into, both, again, from Hamilton Books. This is <clears throat> Kingdoms of Faith, A New History of Islamic Spain by Brian A. Katlos. And this just tells the, uh, the rise of, um, of Sephardic... Uh, Sephardic uh, present. Well, I mean, I, I don't know the extent to which they'll be discussing Sephardic Jews in in Spain or the whole Iberian Peninsula, but I mean, I, I guess they have to if they if they want to discuss all of uh, Islamic Spain too. But um, it's the entire history. So um, this is. Um, just it describes itself as a history of Islamic Spain. This next one is, I guess, a more slightly specific. This is Exiles in Sephirod, uh, the Jewish millennium in Spain. So this specifically tells about uh, the Jews uh, living in the Iberian Peninsula. Um, just, just a really fascinating topic, how how Jews lived uh, next to um, and with and within um, the, the Islamic caliphates. This is um, actually uh, not, not written by a professional historian. I looked on the back, the guy who wrote it, his name is uh, Jeffrey Gorski, he is a lawyer and diplomat, or perhaps was, I don't know, uh, at the U.S. Department of State, nationally recognized expert in immigration law and a former U.S. vice consul in Bilbao, Spain and a former Iberian intelligence analyst. 
about. And I, I guess he's just, you know, does his whole uh, interest in medieval Islamic and uh, Sephardic Jews in Spain as, as a side gig. Interesting stuff. So I found that too. Also, really inexpensive. Something else I've... Uh, an author I trust implicitly, having read, I think, three books by her now. This would be my fourth. This is Anne Applebaum's uh, Stalin's War on Ukraine, uh, The Red Famine. And this is all about the uh, Holomador. Uh, for those of you who don't know what the Holomador is, it was <clears throat> uh, in the late 20s, I think 1929-1930, Stalin started to ramp up one of his first big experiments in Soviet socialism slash communism, which was large-scale agricultural collectivization. And uh, it was, in many respects, a failure, a complete and total failure. And the people who suffered from it were largely uh, the Ukrainians. And I think the, the argument that she makes in this book is that that wasn't just happenstance. That wasn't just a random event that, uh, that Stalin actually planned to kill Ukrainians. Um, perhaps, the, maybe it was because they had a, a large Jewish population. I, I don't know why he wanted to target Ukrainians specifically. Uh, maybe it was an ethnic, I, I don't know. I'll have to read the book to find out. But it is about the Holomador, which uh, ran from around 1931 to around 1933 and killed... Uh, as far as historians can estimate, about as many people died in the Holocaust. So, um, uh, <laughs> Anne Applebaum is not known for being a writer of the most uplifting subjects, but she's always insightful and interesting to read. So, I bought that. So this, when I do the second part of this book haul, um, whenever I end up posting that, I, you'll see a common theme, and a lot of the books will be about medieval and Renaissance history, and not just history, but specifically intellectual history and philosophy. I was uh, sent this book by Oxford University Press, a few months ago. It is written by my favorite podcaster, whose name is Peter Adamson. If you don't know Peter Adamson, he is, a, a, I believe, American-born professor of philosophy, and he teaches, teaches Islamic philosophy in Germany, in, in, uh, in Munich. He has a podcast called The History of Western Philosophy Without Any Gaps, and he has come out so far with five volumes this thick of basically condensations of his podcast. They're not exact scripts, but um, they are uh, basically reader notes, liner notes to the podcast, I guess. And this is his volume for Medieval Philosophy. Um, you can, you can buy this straight from Oxford University Press. Um, I, I promised them a review when I got to it. So, uh, you will be seeing a review on this channel. And it basically is, this covers around 80 of his podcasts. He comes out with one every week. And he's done, I want to say, on the order of 450 to 500 of them. He's been doing it for 10 years. In fact, just just uh, earlier this month, he celebrated his 10-year anniversary. Um, so in this particular volume, 
which covers the medievals. He starts with uh, Charlemagne, the court of Charlemagne, so early 9th century. And, of course, you know, we'll probably, uh, you know, discuss the Carolingian Renaissance and Alcuin and the court of Char Charlemagne, etc. And he goes all the way through early medieval philosophy, um, middle medieval philosophy, then the flowering of the height of the Middle Ages, and we come down in the 14th century with Raymond Lull and Petrarch. That's where we end. Uh, he is now, if you are interested in following him, uh, go ahead and just Google history of philosophy without any gaps. He is now doing uh, two series simultaneously. He switches off uh, in the weeks. He, one is on uh, Africana philosophy, which is basically both philosophy of Africa and the various African diasporas. And the other one is on Renaissance philosophy. So hopefully that will be coming out within a year or two. He'll wrap up his Renaissance series and we'll have a book at least this thick uh, for me to uh, sink my teeth into. By the way, um, I was thinking about doing a separate video where I talked about a couple of my favorite podcasts, and that would certainly be one of them I talked about. I also have a favorite uh, YouTube science content maker who, uh, who I, I won't mention now, but if anyone is interested in who that might be, I would uh, love to make a video about her. Three more. Um, this is... The Cynic and the Fool, The Unconscious in Theology and Politics by Tad DeLay. Uh, Tad DeLay um, is a writer and a teacher. It's uh, several various institutions in the state of Colorado. And um, it's, it's a bit on the theoretical side. I'll read you a chunk from the back. The questioning of religion is the beginning of a flood one which cannot be contained and will soon drown every theological, political, economic, and cultural orthodoxy that pledged its allegiance to a sinking cause. We are in just such an era of revolt, and those with eyes to see are learning to interrogate motives. When we, hold of, when we, uh, when, when we are told of an idea that cannot possibly be true, the most immediate question is this. Does the speaker so very foolishly believe their own words, or is the person a cynic who knows perfectly well how they manipulate the truth? As individual personalities transform into a collective drive, the aftermath is a brutal mix of motives, fictions, and anxieties. So uh, it says it explores theology and politics through the lens of our unconscious motives, our clever repression, and our deceptive denial. It's a short little thing with I think something like ten nine chapters. So um, uh, as always uh, it's superfluous to say on my channel I review everything I ever show you eventually. Uh, expect a review. This is from the same a uh, publisher, uh, Wiffenstock. This is by Corey Miller. This is In Search of the Good Life Through the Eyes of Aristotle, Maimonides, and Aquinas. So this is just a, a sort of comparative look at three different orientations of what three very important thinkers thought what it was to lead a life worth living, a good life. The only one I could really tell you a lot about was Aristotle, and I know Aquinas took a lot from Aristotle, so I'm curious to see how those two differ. As far as Maimonides goes, I've had limited access to the, uh, well, limited exposure to the Guide for the Perplexed, but couldn't tell you much about Maimonides as a standalone ethical thinker. 
And last but not least, certainly not least when it comes to heft, um, you'll probably recognize this from a couple of years ago. I think uh, several people mentioned it and showed it on their channels. Um, this is Fatal Discord, Erasmus, Luther, and the Fight for the Western Mind by Michael Massing. Sort of reading the inside flaps, and um, Michael Massing makes it kind of sound like <clears throat> the, the rivalry about, between Luther and, and Erasmus was the beginning of the, the division between Christian humanists and evangelical Christians. Which I think, which I think might be kind of a um, an anachronistic reading of history, but I don't even know if that's what he's arguing. That's just kind of what the the inside covers, uh, the inside flaps insinuate. I'll have to read the actual nine hundred page book to tell you if that's the case or not. But I have already consumed twenty one plus minutes of your time. I will let you go, and I will see you, hopefully, in less than two and a half weeks. I will see you later. Bye.